and welcome to the Sunrise Safari and on this almost bright and very beautiful morning out here in Onjuma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa we are heading out to see what incredible wildlife is going to put on a show for you today my name is Jamie and I have Jandre on camera with me this morning Brent is out with Dave in the other vehicle searching for more wonderful things and together we're going to bring you the Sunrise Safari and since we are coming to you live what that means is that we are also interactive which means you can send through questions and comments on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv we also have Rebecca and Lou in final control directing us today and we're heading out to see what we can find and we've also got oh yes we've also got Steph out on bushwalk I didn't see Steph this morning but he will be out when it gets just that little bit lighter light enough to go out walking it's a bit dark at the moment it'd be very silly to go wandering about on foot now but between the three of us that is what we're going to be doing. And we are all bundled up this morning. Apparently, right? I don't believe that's true. I've got a hot water bottle that Brent kindly made me, tucked inside my jacket. So it's sort of, yeah, <laughs> every now and again attempting to fall out. And then Rebecca, in light of the fact that my beanie struggles to stay on my head has very kindly lent me a headband to try and Rebecca it's terribly kind of you but how is this meant to keep you warm there's holes there's holes everywhere <laughs> now bear with me for one second <laughs> I mean I'm sure it looks very nice and I could probably use it to keep my earpiece in more effectively than I have done but it's it's not there's a sort of a cold patch on top of my head and Brent's trying to get hold of me on the Game Drive channel. Bear with me for one second. Let's see if he's picked up on any tracks. Standing by. Copy. Thanks, Brent. I'm on my way. Brent's telling me that there's lions calling around Cheetah Plains. Uh, no, Gary Bain. Che cut line so the southern eastern boundary of Juma that's of course where we're on our way to anyway because it's en route to Cheetah Plains and we're going to go look for quarantine I think this morning and as we head across Brent is out and about as well and I think he would like to say good morning to you all morning and welcome to Safari Live my name's a Brent Leo Smith and now, for once, I'm going to get this right. Dangerous Dave? Eastor. Eastor. So, Dave has been letting me call him Eastbach for about three months, and he keeps forgetting to tell me after I've done it. So, it's Eastor. Apparently, it's of French descent. Mm. Uh, and it is a, a chilly, chilly morning, and I've made a plan. And I, I made some hot water bottles this morning. I was very clever and very, very nice. And uh, along with my mitts and my hot tea, I think I'm prepared for this cold morning. And the lions are calling all over the place, so we're going to go check the northern boundary of Juma. It sounds like there's some lions there, there sounds like there's other lions towards the southern boundary, and there's, it sounds like there's more lions to the west. So, lions, lions everywhere, so while they're making a noise, we're going to see if we can find them. And then once they stop making a noise, if we don't find them, we're going to go look for some leopards. But of course, I love these cold mornings, even though I don't love the cold. It means the cats are on the prowl for a little longer. So a better chance of finding them on the move. Let's get going. Well, James Richard is uh, convinced today is the day. <laughs> Poor Brent. I'm sure he was trying to tell you something most profound. Unfortunately, he's disappeared off your screens. Um, Wendy, as you know, or as most of you know, has been struggling a little bit with signal. Wendy is the vehicle that Brent is driving. Uh, every now and again you go through a bad patch of signal. 
where the picture disappears and there's a bit of a risk now for us as well as we go through this dip so I'm just going to be quiet for the moment hopefully we stay with you and we'll stop on the other side and have a look at the beautiful sunrise Come on, Rusty. Up. Oh, there you go. Well done. Let us go and see if we cannot find those lions on our way to Cheetah Plains. Nippy. Not the best view in the house, but it is a really nice view of a leadwood tree and the sunrise. I'm just going to fix my earpiece quickly while you look at that. should be all sorted. Whew. It's quite nice to stop and try and drive with one hand tucked underneath my jacket around the hot water bottle. The hot water bottle is very brightly patterned and really quite quite lovely <laughs> and actually quite dirty now that I look at it. It's been living in the cupboard for the past few months and that goes underneath layer two and three of the jacket to provide a little bit of extra warmth and comfort and I've got a cold so I'm feeling particularly sorry for myself this morning. And a very warm welcome to Shamsun from Lenemo who is a new viewer and there's a spider web attached to the camera lens. Let's we'll grab that for you. You're a new viewer and would like us to explain to you the way in which boundaries work and the way in which sort of the whole area works, where we can go, where we can't, and whether or not we, not we ever tag animals in order to track them. Well, first of all, welcome to the Safari Live Addiction. We're very glad to have you on board and I'm sure we'll be hearing lots more from you in the future. Now, essentially, the Savi Sands, where we are, is part of a far greater conservancy, which includes the famous greater, or the famous Kruger National Park, a place called Manuleti, Timbavati, Baluli, all kinds of different parcels of land that are owned by different people. Within the Savi Sands itself, Savi Sands is broken up into different parcels of land, different landowners, all working together towards a common goal of conservation through ecotourism. What that means is because there's lots of different lodges, lots of different landowners, you gotta be careful that you don't have too many vehicles driving around and utilizing different parts of lands, over, sort of over utilizing them. So it gets split up into different places and it concerns all kinds of things that are far above my pay grade, including politics and, and financial situations, but it's all basically for the greater good, first of all, for the animals and the ecosystem. And then second of all, for the visitors that come to the Sabi Sands. Because the more vehicles that are waiting to get into a sighting, the less time the guests can actually spend with that animal. And therefore, the shorter their experience, and it's just not quite as good as it could be. And of course, the future of this incredible place, as well as the animals, is dependent upon tourism. So what we have is we have a situation, we're in the northern Sabi Sands and we drive Juma, which is one parcel of land, Arethusa, which is on the western area, and Cheetah Plains, which is a little bit of a drive away, but is to the south and east of us here. 
And then all around us are our neighbors. We communicate regularly with whoever gets to drive those places. And between us all as a team, we can monitor the movements of the different animals, whether they be lions, leopards, or anything else of a similar nature. And between those three parcels of land, we have about 2,000 hectares of our own little private piece, not quite private, but our own piece of this stunning conservation area. 2,000 hectares out of about 4 million. So the animals that you are seeing don't have to recognize our boundaries. We do, but the animals don't. They've got a 4 million hectare playground in which to move about. No fences in between the sections. And basically just an incredible area that extends all the way into Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Now, do we track and tag the animals? We do not tag them. There are certain elephant herds, there are certain buffalo herds that do wear collars for monitoring purposes and that is for research only that's not to help that's to help the researchers find them and to monitor their movements as part of a greater study to assist in the conservation of those animals now to put a radio collar on an animal has a limited lifespan because it's de it's dependent upon batteries and it's it also is quite it is worth it for research purposes but it is inevitably a relatively invasive process for the animal. The animal has to be anaesthetized. Um, so in other words, it has to be asleep because I can promise you that there is no wild animal out here that's going to let you close enough to pop a collar on them without severe risk of injury to the people concerned. Uh, we don't collar them, but we do monitor their movements very, very closely. And we share that data with a couple of different organizations, but most importantly, an organization called Panthera. And what that means is that we can actually, through mapping software, ArcGIS, Quantum GIS, those sorts of programs, can actually monitor and start to build up a picture of the different animals' home ranges and territories. Plus also, I mean, it's quite fun going out and not knowing exactly where the animals are. It would detract from the experience a little bit, I feel. Half the fun is in tracking the animals down and trying to find them. That is one of the reasons why we do not utilize those sorts of, those sorts of means here. We could, and certain projects could motivate to, for example, put a collar on one of the leopards to monitor their progress. It just depends on the circumstances and the justification behind it. I think it's going to, it's going to be a beautiful morning. Just in case you were wondering where Brent has gone, he has lost his picture completely. But we've got a nice way to start off our morning with a lovely big elephant bull on the opposite side of the drainage line. Thank you, Jandre. Jandre's eagle eyes spotted our large pachyderm. Enjoying his early morning breakfast. We've been so fortunate with elephants recently that there are just so many about. Oh, I'm not sure if you heard that fish eagle calling. We haven't heard them all that much since most of the dam started to dry up. A typical African sound. He's got a trunk full of something. Quite hard to tell at this distance. Probably bush willow. I can also hear other elephants crunching away in the distance. So he's not completely alone. Now how did I know that it was a male at this distance? Well, one of the reasons is the thickness of his tusks, although that's not a defining feature. Usually the tusks of the males are slightly larger than those of the females. Thicker, at least, not necessarily longer. 
He's also got, although he's reaching up now, he's, oh, he's beautiful. But his profile, his forehead, is much more round than that of a female. And then the biggest giveaway is actually the fact that he's all alone. There's no other elephant. elephant. He might be associating with a herd that I can hear further off in the distance. Double checking to see if any of the females might be ready to mate. For the most part, his day-to-day -day existence is spent largely in a solitary way, unless he happens to join up with a group of other males. Now, if we were to be on foot, because of their level of comfort and confidence as one of the as the largest thing out here, elephant bulls can actually be a really nice animal to walk and to approach on foot. Obviously with great caution and making sure the best way to walk an animal or to enjoy a sighting on foot is to actually for the animal to not know that you're here. This would be a really perfect position because he's on right on the other side of the drainage line. He is totally his smell is blowing towards us so we are downwind of him and we'd be able to safely sit up on the bank and observe his behavior and it would probably be for him at the perfect distance for him to be quite comfortable with us the impala are alarm calling I just want to listen closely to where the, where they are exactly and I'll explain to you what I mean in a moment. Antelope like impala, for our newer viewers, they alarm call. In other words, they give bursts of alarm calls, so a barking, quite a harsh call. And they do that in response to usually either people or for um, leopards or lions or cheetah. Now that was just one bark, or two barks, that came from the impala. Usually if it's a leopard walking through, the whole herd might do that. But, at the moment the impala are rutting, which means there's a lot of males out on their own. And something scared that male, and it's time for us to go investigate. Because it could well be those lions walking down the road. So we're going to leave our Ellie Bull. He's actually moved off behind the trees anyway. We're going to go and see. And yesterday, Herbert was tracking Karula, the queen of Juma, the female leopard whose home range falls mainly in the center of the area in which we drive, and a leopard whose story has been followed for many, many years. She's now 12, and she has just recently had two cubs that we've been fortunate enough to spend some really quality time with. All right, let's see what's got this impala upset. Everybody, keep your eyes peeled. Yesterday we spent the morning trying to track down the Birmingham boys, the four male lions that have formed a coalition and are dominant in this area and they've been exceptionally scattered. And Impala hasn't alarm called once. And good morning to Chitra in India. You were wondering if I could enlighten you as to the lion population in this reserve as a whole. And it's an interesting one because generally the counts that they do, they only publish about two years later for some bizarre reason. So they do monitor the population, but they only really publish it um, after the event. So the last numbers I read were around 2,500, but those are old figures. They're not even two years ago figures, they are old figures. And I think that at this point it will be much, much higher. So Chitra, I would guess at around 3,000, maybe even closer to 4,000. The reason I say that 
is because it's actually this area has the highest, or close to this area, has the highest concentration of lions in Africa. And that's around the Sitara Rest Camp in the Kruger National Park. It's basically directly to the east of us. Just bear with me one second. I want to just see. Um, Brent's trying to contact me on the Game Drive channel. Standing by. Copy that, thank you, Brent. Well, there is a chance that we are not going to be able to get to Cheetah Plains, unfortunately, and that's just because with Brent's signal being what it is, we would disappear from your screens completely if we were to do so. So what Brent's is letting me know is that he's going to double check around Buffalo's Hook Dam. Now, I'm relatively certain we're about to find lion tracks on this road. Just want to double check. They're going to be here somewhere. I heard them calling in this area last night. Chitra, sorry, I was answering, I was in the process of answering your question. Oh dear. Poor Rusty's also struggling now. Rusty's firing off four cylinders instead of five. So it's not just poor driving on my, my part. I actually do have a slight problem. It's okay, Rusty. We seem to be beset by gremlins, technological and mechanical. Now, Chitra, in terms of the lion population, those numbers are a rough estimate. And of course, it, they could well be more, they could well be less. What we will see, what I can guarantee, is that we are going to see an increase in the lion population over the next few months. And the reason I say that is the fact that South Africa is currently in the grips of the worst drought in the last, excuse me, in the last hundred or so years. Uh, for the herbivores, that is a bad thing. There's not very much food for them. There's not going to be enough water for them all but for the lions the hyenas the predators in general this is going to be the time of a population boon because it will be a time of plenty for all of them relatively exciting times for the predators lie ahead and we're certainly we'll, we're already seeing it with our hyena clan on Juma they're doing exceptionally well Oh, that's wonderful. We don't often get to see this, but I'm going to show you something, a really nice special site. Hopefully, he decides to say. I'm going to get a bit closer, but there is a male giraffe that is resting and actually lying down. He knows exactly where those lions are. And there you go. We have an answer for Matt in Nashville. He wanted to know how animals like elephants and giraffes sleep. And hopefully this gentleman's going to give us a bit of an indication and then I can fully answer Matt's question. Just going nice and slowly so he doesn't feel disturbed in any way. Hello, boy. Here we go. A giraffe lying down to ruminate. Now, Matt, a giraffe will lie down like this. They do not completely lie with their necks flat. And that's because they are so adapted in terms of their circulatory system to pump blood up against gravity to the brain that with their complicated system of first of all high pressure blood vessels and then second of all valve systems in their neck they cannot actually lower their head for more than 30 seconds at a time without risking 
um, blood flowing away from their brain and actually fainting. They've also got a, a spongy tissue around the brain to protect it from any damage that might be done. They're incredibly adapted in terms of the way in which they are structured. That being said, they do need to sleep and doze, and what they will do is they'll lie down like this gentleman here. Now he is clearly not sleeping. They do not need to sleep as often as other as we do as human beings. A 20 minute nap or so every now and again will be perfect for them and in fact they're very vulnerable in this position so they don't really want to fall deeply asleep. What's interesting is that as a ruminant this process that he's currently doing now where he is chewing on the cud that have come up from his rumen, in other words balls of grass, is munching away at it and Studies have shown that he actually, this is part of, or his brain waves will register the same as rapid eye movement sleep. So an animal ruminating is actually, whilst not quite sleeping as we know it, is doing something very similar because it is such an instinctive reaction. And while we watch him as he chews, Brent's trying to get hold of me once again. Let me just double check, see if maybe he's found those lions for you. Go ahead. Copy that, thank you. I'm at um, Gary Main Cheetah Cut Line. No tracks yet. I'm very just letting me know that he's got fresh tracks of a male lion wandering around a Buffles Hook Dab. And we'll start heading across in that direction. We'll cancel our Cheetah Plains plans for this morning. And we will hang around there. Brent is making his way back towards camp to see if they can't sort out the problems with Wendy. Now Max, you didn't just ask about giraffe. Although that's what we touched on. You also asked about elephants. Now elephants do not sleep for extended period of time, but they do sleep. The babies, when they're very young, need more sleep than the adults. That makes sense. That's like pretty much any mammal that's doing lots of growing in a very short space of time. So what will happen with a herd full of babies is the babies will lie down and go fast, go straight to sleep, possibly for up to about an hour, even longer. The adults don't need to sleep as much, but a full-grown elephant can and will occasionally lie down. They'll usually lie up against a termite mound or a big tree, resting their weight there and allowing them to pull themselves back up again. It was a bit, bit easier when fighting gravity, acting on a four to six ton body weight. Um, so they can and are capable of rolling around. What you often see is an elephant sleeping, standing up and resting their head against a marula tree or something similar. I've walked before and accidentally bumped into a couple of elephants that are so fast asleep they have absolutely no idea that I'm here. This giraffe on the other hand is keeping a close eye on us. He knows that we're here. And Sandy, you were wondering if that is scarring on his neck. And it could be one of two things. It could be a skin disease, some kind of mange or a fungal infection that giraffe in particular are prone to in terms of their skin conditions. But it could well also be a scar and it could have just been a place where he had nicked his skin in some way, maybe just walked past the wrong thorn that hooked and created a little bit of a hole. And that then would be constantly kept open by the actions of ox pickers and in fact even made even larger, creating the possibility for secondary infection at the same time. So it could be a scar as well. But just have a look. Oh, that's awesome. You can see the bolus come up there. I'll talk about that in a moment. Just have a look. We've seen this gentleman before. He's the one with the slightly messed up left ear. It's a bit, a bit floppy a bit scarred and nicked. Of course says tubby-eared giraffe. And yes, absolutely. He's very easily recognizable with his slightly different left ear. 
Alright, let's just watch for one second with this view. There you go. Did you see that bolus coming up through the neck? Let's watch him for one more second. He's going to chew for about 15 to 30 seconds. Oh, he's busy re-chewing that ball, all part of this complex digestive system. And now let's wait for a moment to see if when he swallows. Oh, this one's particularly, obviously needs a bit more attention. A typical side-to-side -side motion of a ruminant. <laughs> this is the world's longest mouthful. It must be nearly there. There you go. Swallow now. Watch. Watch his neck. Wait for the next one to come back up. Oh, there we go. Through the muscle actions of the neck, pushing that bolus back up from the stomach all the way up that two meter neck and into the mouth. Reverse peristalsis. There we go. Up it goes and into his mouth. Oh, Carol Patterson, you were saying, I was saying, he was saying, I was saying, sorry, that's a terrible sentence. You were asking or wondering if I could elaborate a bit on a giraffe's ligaments. The fascinating thing about them is not only are they um, incapable of keeping their head down below the level of their heart for too long, but they also, this is the natural resting position of a giraffe. So running down at the back of his head from the top of his skull, just behind those ossicones, all the way along the back of the vertebra and down towards the shoulder is an incredibly tough ligament or tendon. And what that means is that it actually, the natural resting position of a giraffe is his head held upright. And it's only when he contracts those large muscles at the base of his neck so on the left hand side of what you're looking at now, that he can actually pull his head down. Uh, that's the way in which giraffe can lean forward to drink. And he's also, in terms of that, it's, it's connected to his circulatory system. And it's something that the fighter pilots and other engineers have looked at in terms of dealing with interesting pressure situation. So in his legs, the skin is actually particularly tight and the pressure is particularly tight because obviously he's got to, they've got to get the blood, he's got to get blood first of all up to his neck and then down towards his leg and then pushing it back up. Now, uh, and this is the first time that you've ever seen a giraffe lying down or sitting down like this. You're wondering how quickly can he get up? Probably it would take him about two seconds to get up. So they can get up relatively quickly. They get up rapidly and they get up in the same way that a camel would. So that whole pro rocking process of lifting up their bodies. Uh, he'll be able to launch himself upward relatively quickly, but it's not that fast a process. So you'll find that when giraffes do lie down like this, it's usually in a place where they can keep an eye out for any threats because he, he is a potential sitting target for something like a pride of lions. He's a big boy and they'd have their work cut out for them, but a pride with a couple of males, maybe if the Inkahumas banded together or hunted together with the Birmingham boys, they could actually take down a giraffe of his size. He is a big gentleman, and I think we're actually probably going to leave him. I want to go and see if we can't figure out where those lions have gone. And Sadi, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering how long a giraffe will live for, and is this a reticulated or a Maasai giraffe? And the answer is they can live up to 20 years, although their natural life span in the wild is probably a little bit less on average. And no, it is not a reticulated or a Maasai giraffe. Now, there's lots and lots of argument in terms of the different giraffe subspecies. 
Now in this case, we are looking at what is known as a savanna or a southern African giraffe. We've probably, in terms of our giraffe species, we've probably got the ones with the most boring name. But there are lots and lots of, well, there's, there's debate, there's between seven to nine different giraffe subspecies. We are right down at the bottom of southern Africa, which means that we don't have the reticulated or the Maasai giraffe. Uh, earlier on, I think it might have been yesterday or the day before, Scott Dyson, who used to be a presenter here at Wild Earth, before he went on looking for new and more exciting, not more exciting, just different possibilities, he posted a picture of a reticulated giraffe from the Maasai Mara. There's also giraffe species known as, Ma as um, what's the word, Rothschild, is one example of a subspecies of giraffe. But it is a matter that's up for debate. One of the It is a matter for debate as to just how many different subspecies there are. And difference in coloration and so on that determines it. Uh, Batty Bobati, you were wondering about... Sorry, your question's just gone straight out of my head. Hold on one second, it'll come back to me. Oh yes, I spoke about how the way in which they get up is related to camels or, or are they or looks like a camel you were wondering are they related as such and the answer is yes to a degree they are they are come from a similar common ancestor they're also the only one of the animals out here that walks in the same way as a camel and what I mean is that all of so when it when a giraffe walks both the right front and the right back legs move at the same time so they walk with the same side moving at the same time. What that means, and that's exactly the same as a camel and the only other animal that does that is the okapi, what that means is they've basically got two strides. They walk or they run. They can't, they're not capable of that high bouncing trot that the different antelope species are capable of. Uh, they do share an ancestor, they are well ad adapted as well for, first of all, for fat storage but also mostly for water retention, so not wasting water in arid areas. Now there is, and of course the, the Latin name for a, a giraffe is Camilla pardus, uh, a camel horse. Oh sorry, a camel, leopard camel, which you can kind of see. It's a spotted camel with a very long neck. And good morning to Mandy Kirshner and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering about how we interact with the other guides. So Mandy, what we have is a radio and it gives us the Game Drive channel. There's different ones for different parts of the reserve and we talk to them on here. We've also got a couple of WhatsApp groups because we are in the age of great technology. And then, of course, we talk to them in person as well, and we kind of try to maintain a very professional way of making sure that we drive an area and look for all of the animals that we could possibly see, as well as working together as a team to help to track down and to find animals, which is something that I would like to go and do now. I'm going to go check around Buffleshook Dam. In the meantime, it's become light enough for Steph to be out on bushwalk, and I think he would like to say good morning. There you're watching our, basically what we had for, for sunrise this morning. We're standing in this valley and to be quite honest with you, it's been a chilly start for us. We've been walking up a drainage line that's just on the other side of, uh, of the DRC this morning and we are heading in a westerly direction towards uh, Sydney's Dam. For those of you who haven't met me yet, I'm Stefan Winterboer and on camera today is Viam. <laughs> <laughs> We've been freezing watching these, watching the sun come. We can have a look at the hairs on my arms are standing up all nice and straight at the moment, and that's because um, we wanted to come and have a look for some 
lion that were making a big noise around our camp last night. It sounded like they were calling from as far away as Abazajan, to be quite honest. This, this wash here that we've got, you can see that the terrain where we are, it's very undulating terrain and, and surprisingly it bounces sound around. What is quite phenomenal is with bated breath we are waiting for this sun to come to us and you can see as VM lifts up the camera there you can actually see a moon in the background and the light shining on the trees. And once it's up, usually the coldest time for me is, is at sunrise. As soon as the sun cracks that horizon the temperature always feels like it drops two or three degrees. I, I think it's my head that's busy telling me that it should be warm but it isn't just yet. But in any case, I think a good idea would be to follow us up here. You can come on a bit of an adventure with us so you can see exactly where we've been walking today. This funnel is where elephants and what looks like some rhino and some buffalo have had a health spa. This during the last rains would have filled up and as you can see from the very dark grey colour of the soil that's inside of it, it's actually been plastered with clay. Now this clay would come into, either it would be present in the soil already, or the clay would be brought in here on the backs of buffalo and actually plaster the sides of these, of these basins and in effect really just roofing them. The which makes them hold water for a lot longer than what, what they would normally. And obviously, as animals come to the water, it would definitely start to create some, basically, just some mud pool. Technical issue is because of the drainage. Are you going to send? Well, they sort out the problems with the bushwalk. <laughs> We're going to move out of this poor vehicle's way, they've been, we've been blocking their path for the last few minutes and I've only just seen them, so I'm starting to feel a bit guilty. Hello, sorry everybody in that car, I didn't see you there, thank you for being very polite. And there's our giraffe, I'm not going to stop because he will get up. I'm going to keep going. The reason I did that and so it, poor Jandre had to kind of swing and then swing back again was because if we focused on them the, he would have got up because we were quite close so he would have been comfortable with us going past but if we'd stopped there he would have got up and moved. Now Roger you were wondering in terms of giraffe whether or not they are endangered or whether they are classified as um, out, not, not at risk the answer to that is yeah, it's area dependent. So in South Africa we've got a very very healthy population of giraffe. There are certain subspecies that are more at risk than others and if you take the giraffe population of the world as a whole then yes they could be considered to be vulnerable. Uh, that applies to almost all of the mammal species out here due to the constant sort of interaction with people, their constant lack, lack, loss of habitat, loss of their home ranges. It's a very difficult thing for them in terms of dealing with it. There's fresh male lion tracks on this road. I'm not going to stop to show you because we're going to try and catch up with him. I'll show you if and only if he's moved off the road because he's walking. This is the line that they heard earlier. And he is somewhere here. So keep your eyes peeled. These are really fresh tracks. So this morning, if you joined us from the start of the sunrise safari, you would have known that Brent called me and said that there were lions calling from that corner where we were sitting with the giraffe. He's somewhere here, making his way up towards where Brent was tracking that lion at Buffles Hook Dam. Oh, 
All right, well, we track this male lion. Let's go back over to Steph, who's up and running. Well, we're back. We're back with you again. We've managed to hightail it out of that little drainage line we were in and come back out onto a crest so that we have a little bit of a clearer view uh, for our signal, at least, anyway. And what VM was busy showing you over there, which is quite interesting, was the fact that this bush seems to be draped with a multitude of spider webs. The best example is probably up here, VM, <clears throat> right close to right close to the stick. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of anchor lines. And rather than it actually being a spider's web, so to say, what you're having a look at there is where spiders have been hunting during the night and depositing some silk. That there, in actual fact, is a little retreat. And that would have been probably built by the spider as it started getting a little bit too cold for the spider to move around. They are cold-blooded animals, which means that they have the environment, they need the environment's ambient temperature for metabolic pro processes. And that means when it's too cold, they actually stop moving. And when it gets too hot, they actually can overheat and die as well. They're not like we are, where our bodies can shiver to make us warm and where we can sweat to make us cold. So we're warm-blooded, which means that we create our own metabolic temperature and we keep our body at the optimum range. Cold-blooded animals take their temperature from the environment and use that to basically control metabolic processes. At the moment, it's a little bit, it's so cold at the moment, it feels like my metabolic processes are way too cold. It's difficult to actually talk. And VM and I were actually discussing why that is, why do we get so cold when it's actually not that cold? It's probably a good few degrees, probably 10 degrees centigrade, between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius, which is not that cold at all, um, way above freezing, but, uh, but definitely has had an effect on us this morning. We've been a bit slow this morning, in talking at least anyway. Anyway, I think it's a good idea for us to carry on walking along this crest. This is very close to where we've had a hyena den in the past. We are on um, shortcut Gallagher Road. I just needed to listen to that. That was a big noise. It sounded like some lorry of some sort though, but rather than an elephant. But I think, VM, let's carry on going over here. I want to go and have a look at what's happened to this termitarium that these hyena have excavated. Not only do hyena live in termitarium, but you also get aardvark and you get warthog. You get a whole bunch of animals that will use discarded termitarium. And although it was not suitable for hyena for whatever reason, you never quite know what's going to be moving in. It's always a bit of an exploration on one of these walks, to tell you the honest truth. I'm always constantly busy looking into the bushes. You can see that there's quite a thicket off, off over here onto our left-hand side. We will go and have a look at it in a second. And you can see that while we're busy walking, I'm looking into this bush to see what's crawled in it. And what's immediately apparent about this, which is quite interesting, is the fact that this elephant, who last fed on this particular buffalo thorn, you can see how they've scraped the bark off. Those marks there are from an elephant's tusk. It looked like, it almost looked like graffiti, but in actual fact, it's an elephant that's used the tip of his tusk to pry off pieces of bark and eat bark. Here you can see, it doesn't look very nutritious, and in actual fact, that woody piece on the bottom there isn't very nutritious, but this, the cambium layer, is. So that reddish layer that you're seeing there, that is what elephants are after. And they'll eat all of that just to get at that. And they don't eat this. That obviously hasn't, hasn't got any nutritional value or very little nutritional value. That's just to provide support for the plant and to get it higher than its neighbors so that it can get to the sun. So that's what the woody central part of the tree is all about. And this poor buffalo thorn took the brunt of this elephant's wrath whenever it was. That's a pretty old feeding sign. Fresh feeding sign would have us, would have this tree full of green leaves. You can see this is part of the original tree that was debarked with no leaves. And if you go off to the left here a little bit, you can see another buffalo thorn, not the same one that has got the green leaves on it. 
An elephant spent hours in buffalo thorn thickets, busy eating the leaves. And it's quite amazing actually because they've got these quite vicious thorns. You can have a look over there at the thorn view and we'll try and show you now. They've got a hooked thorn and they've got a straight thorn. Now the hooked thorns are almost always there to stop animals from stripping leaves off of the branch. And the straight thorns are there to dissuade animals from pushing their snouts or their muzzles into a bush. So it provides a prick on the tip of the nose and it provides a little bit of a, how do I say, it's a deterrent for eyes. You don't want these sharp thorns going into your eyes. So as soon as whiskers start to feel these sharp thorns, that's the distance that a muzzle needs to stop. So the next time you're having a look at a kudu or you're having a look at a giraffe, have a look at how long their faces have evolved to get them into thickets like this. And that's exactly what's happening with these particular plants, is it's a war, sort of an arms race between the animals that need to get deeper into these thickets to get to the leaves and the plants trying to protect their leaves, trying to protect what they're spending their energy on and hiding it away from, uh, from plants. So they'll sacrifice, quite often they'll sacrifice the outside plants. But... And Deanna's asked an interesting question this morning about how elephants get notches on their tusks. And Deanna, absolutely, you've hit the nail right on the head there. This is exactly how elephants get notches on their tusks and in fact how elephants break their tusks off. They do fight. Bull elephant will quite often break their tusks wrestling with one another, especially if it's a, a real hardcore fight that they're busy having. But generally speaking, if an elephant has a notched tusk or it has a tusk that's been broken off. It's because of the feeding sign that you're seeing like right here. It will be from breaking off a branch. And you can have a look. Have a look at how thick this is here. This is exactly where that elephant broke off that branch. And then used the tusks there to pry it open. And that would have been broken off literally by placing the tusk onto the tree placing their tusk there and then using their massive strength to, to, with their trunk to break off that branch. And that quite often can force enough leverage to break off a tusk. Right, so let's go around the corner. And Roger, having a look at these, the way that these elephants feed on trees has asked a nice question. Do the trees get killed by the elephants or do they sometimes survive? And Roger, it's a good question that because it's true in some senses. Some of the trees will survive, some of the trees don't. I find that the more the, 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 more the wood on the tree is hard or the more brittle the wood is, the less likely the tree is to survive. Except in the case of the combretums. Combretums here, the variable combretum, can survive being totally pushed over and it won't die and it will then carry on growing. It will send up new shoots along a fallen down branch and this is an exact example of that. So here we have a combretum that's been pushed down quite evidently by an elephant and true to form all it's done is it's actually just grown branches that have gone straight up from a fallen tree and this tree is still alive. You can have a look at all the green leaves that are we showing to you there and affectionately this tree is known in Afrikaans as a kiri klapper and that means a kiri is a walking stick in Afrikaans and you can see how wonderful a walking stick this would this would make if you had to break this off and you end up with this knurled head that you then can shape with some woodworking skills much better than mine would be turning this into a nice wood walking stick or wooden walking stick but this is an exact this is an exact example of a tree that can survive being knocked over by elephants where evolution basically has said you're not going to get away from these animals pushing over this tree you might as well just get over it and carry on finding a way to grow all right vm let's carry on going Lindsay, I would say, I would say it is quite painful for an elephant to lose a tusk, but it all depends on where the tusk has been broken off. The tusks are very similar to our teeth. They've got a root that's inside the tusk, but just like our teeth are, it doesn't extend, the root doesn't extend all the way to the tip of the tusk. 
quite often there's a piece of tusk that is just ivory with no root in it and if that breaks off it would be the same as chipping your tooth i quite i can imagine it's quite sore but unless it actually goes down into the actual tooth structure where you've got an exposed nerve there it wouldn't be that sore um, and you see it quite often i must be honest you see elephants with broken and notched tusks more than what you see elephants with uh, with tusks that are entire or that are perfectly formed and so I hope that answered your question. But on that note, we're going to be sending you through to Jamie, who's got an update for you. There you go. Not a lion, although I'm sure he'd like to think so at times, but a young Nyala bull who's only just started to have his horns poking through out of the top of his head. Still that tan colour that females have. He hasn't quite got to the point where he's darkened up in the way of a mature Nyala bull. I always think they look terribly sweet at this age, a bit gangly and almost like little teenagers. Nyala are hands down one of my favorite antelopes in terms of the way that they look. They're just so beautiful. They're looking, on that subject, incredibly relaxed. They don't look upset at all, or like a big male lion has come wandering past them. Although something's got their attention. No, whatever it is has been dismissed summarily. And they're quite happy to keep on moving off into the distance. These male lions are around here somewhere. Uh, core core productions. I mentioned that Nyala are one of my favorite animal, antelope species to look at, although my favorite is actually probably the bushbuck. But you're wondering what is my favorite animal? I can't answer that. It depends on the mood that I'm in. It depends on what it is that I am seeing and what particular animal or what the animal is doing at the time. I'll give you a top list. Elephants are definitely far up there in terms of my favorite animals to watch. And I also really, really enjoy spending time with rhino. They're probably, they were my favorite animal when I was a child and they are the reason that I went into this job or one of the biggest reasons why I went into this line of work. And then spotted hyena, I do really enjoy spending time with them. They've got such mischief about their facial expressions. What else? Wild dog, there's endless excitements with wild dogs. Uh, Andy, you say that you've been watching Safari Live for a couple of weeks and that your favorite animal is the rhino. And you were wondering if there are any here. It's a tricky question to answer that one. We do not, as a part of our policy, unfortunately we do not show rhino. We do not put them on your screens and we do that for a couple of reasons. It's a wild earth policy in the same way that we do not call them in on the game drive channel. So because of the current poaching crisis within South Africa to do with rhino and to, throughout Africa and throughout the world, we are very, very careful and cautious of the fact that given the amount of money that is involved in the poaching industry, and it's one of the, I mean, animal product smuggling is, is one of the largest black market industries in the world, we do not want to run the risk of making it any easier for poachers to find the animals, nor do we want to draw attention to them, but it's also a statement out against rhino poaching so that is why we do not show rhino every now and again something happens by mistake um, it's it's quite difficult to avoid them if you go around a blind corner now if we do accidentally put them on screen that doesn't automatically mean that that animal is in terrible danger because most of the poaching that occurs out here comes from internal information anyway so 
from desperate people selling information, desperately poor people selling information to give away a lion's, I mean, a, a rhino's position. So it doesn't mean that we are endangering those animals in any way, it's just something that we'd rather avoid. We don't want to add to the problem at all. I was sort of hoping he was going to pop out here, to be honest. There's Franklin, Crested Franklin, calling off in the distance. I'm talking about the lion, that is, at this point. He's here somewhere. I'm just hoping that they haven't decided to cross into Torchwood. I think those Franklin are just talking to each other. I think it's just their dawn chorus. Nope, no alarm calls and all is quiet here. Uh, good morning to Roger. Oh boy, come on Rusty, you could do it. We've already used almost a quarter of a tank of petrol as well, just in a short space of time. Come on, up you go Rusty. Sorry, good morning to Roger and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. On the subject of the lions that we are currently looking for, the Birmingham boys, you were wondering, or you said that you don't know whether the Birmingham boys have a pride or not. And the answer to that is actually no male lion coalition has a pride. No male lion has a pride once they are old enough to have left. What they have is a territory which overlaps with several different prides and they will mate with the females from those prides and sometimes just associate with those females from those prides. And what I mean by that is in essence the, the stories like the Lion King seem to suggest that like Fufasa had his pride and he had the one female that he mated with and so on but that's not how it works in true lion dynamics. Now the females will stay together in a home range for their entire lives and that could carry on for generations and generations worth of, fe worth, worth of females sorry whereas males come and go and they win territories and they'll win territories for about usually on average about two years can be even less sometimes in the, the sort of the the exceptions to the rule will sometimes be dominant for four or five years at the moment the Birmingham boys are dominant in this territory and they're dominant over at least the Nkuhuma pride and the Styx pride so you could say that they have those prides. They could well be dominant not over the Talamatis, the Talamatis are um, more associated with the Salati, the two Salati males to the north of us. But the Torchwood pride could well fall under them. Now those are, those are the prides that we know about, that they associate with in, in and around this area. Brent had the tracks for that lion heading across in this direction towards Biffle's Hook Dam. Now I haven't really had the opportunity to check properly for where they've gone just since there's only two of us out and about. And speaking of the two of us, Steph is around and he's found an interesting tree for you. We've wandered into spider heaven and I know the hallmark of the walks over the last couple of weeks have almost just been exclusively spiders. It just seems like this area that we're in at the moment is providing a bounty. VM is trying his best and we're trying our best to show you this tiny, tiny little orbweb spider. It literally is as big as a dollar coin, as big as a five rand coin. The entire web, the spider itself is a few microns there you go. Well done, VM. That, I promise you, is a feat. 
that not very many people will be able to do. That spider is less than a millimeter across. I can actually not even see the spider properly with my naked eye from where I'm standing. I'm literally having to just guess at what you're looking at at the moment. Definitely is an orbweb spider. One of the orbweb spiders, a tiny, tiny little one. And that's probably about the limit of this camera. We've reached the limit. So things that are less than, less than half a millimeter across and no bigger than a dollar coin. <laughs> Which is actually quite phenomenal if you think about it. And that little spider, you can see, just busy running repairs on her web at the moment, sitting in the middle. She'd be able to feel through vibrations anything that hits the web. And then as tiny as what she is, she'd be able to move off of that web, probably catching small little gnats, small little flying insects, small tiny little flies. And that's about that for that little spider. But I've sp sp just spied with my eyes, something that's now on the other scale in terms of spiders, something that's quite big. And this is now also an orbweb spider, but much bigger. This is now the garden orbweb spider. And you can see, I'm going to put my hand behind her. You can see that she's probably about as big as my palm. Now that is definitely much bigger than that spider that we were looking at at the moment. Very typical of these spiders to hang head down. That's what they do. They hang head down and they wait for flies, bees and locusts or what she feeds on and she's got a very fat abdomen. She's definitely had a good summer so far. Isn't that terrifying? <laughs> They're actually harmless. They can do nothing to you. Their particular type of venom can't hurt us at all. Now she's just shaking the web. She's obviously seeing us now. Now you can see there on the back of her abdomen you can see tiny little nobules or nodules. That's also typical of this particular type of orbweb spider, the garden orbweb spider. Called the garden orbweb spider because a few years ago, when these spiders, well, a few years ago, probably close to a hundred years ago now, these spiders were incredibly common uh, in gardens all over the country. Not so much today. Today, insecticides, unfortunately, in urban areas have killed off most of these spiders. Isn't she beautiful? Now, Viam, if you want to come and stand here, I've got a task for us to do. It'll probably be relatively easy considering what you've just filmed right here. But on that strand of silk is her glue. And I can, with my naked eye, I can actually see the blobs of glue that she uses on a piece of silk. And they should look like pearls on a string to you. There you go. Now that's a piece of food that she's wrapped up over there, but you can definitely see how those little blobs of glue are stuck at regular intervals along that silken strand. And that glue is what snares the prey. Isn't that phenomenal? Now not all the silken strands that she produces will have that glue on. Literally just the silken strands that she wants to ensnare her prey with will have that glue on. The rest are used for a variety of different reasons. There's silk that she'll use for a stabilimentum, and I'm going to show you what that is at the moment. There's different silk that she will use to there's different silk that she will use to anchor her her web to the leaves. There's silk that she'll use to wrap prey up. There's even silk that she will use to to hold her egg case and all be different mixes of silk. I'm just busy having a look here. Here's her stabilimentum. It's another one of these garden orb web tricks. This zigzag piece of silk that she's got right here. And that stabilimentum is, provides two things. It'll provide a visual warning to animals that are going to come and feed here that they must stay away, that she does, she's not going to bite them in, but it's just to, hey, there's a spider web here, please don't hurt my web. And secondly, it adds a bit of a spring uh, effect to the actual web. So it gives the web a little bit of 
tensile strength. Now, a question has just come through as to baby spiders, can they, can they spin silk from when they're born? And the answer to that is absolutely. Spiders can spin silk from when they're born. These particular spiders, what will happen is they'll hatch out of an egg. The baby spider will then crawl up to this branch, all the way to the top. They will then collect at the top of this web, and then they will start to release silk in these strands. And as the silk gets longer, so the drag on that silken line from the, from the air currents increases. And at a point, the drag on the, air, on, the, on the silken strand will pluck the baby spider off of the branch and start carrying it away on the breeze. And they've, with quite interesting ways of collecting insects with weather balloons and these funny low pressure cages with these scoops on, have collected spiders thousands and tens of thousands of feet into the atmosphere. The baby spiders will eventually come down on some air currents and that's how spiders distrib distribute from one area to another. Obviously not all spiders go into the upper atmosphere. A lot of spiders just literally float from here to a tree in the background and then get snagged on a branch there and that's when they'll live. But you, you do get clusters of spiders and what we're in right here is one of these spider clusters and it's probably because there's a lot of thick bush around where we are at the moment and spiders on these air currents when they were younger started to get caught up in this area. So Carol has just asked me, while I found another type of spider even, Carol's just asked me a nice question, um, will these spiders be or occur much longer into winter? Carol, it all depends on how cold a winter we have this year. If we have a, a, a few very bad cold fronts coming one after another, then the spiders won't last much more into May or probably just end up in the beginning of June. But last year we had a very warm winter where we didn't have cold weather until deep into June. And we saw spiders deep into June before they disappeared. Now, this is a ground living spider. This is our tarantula. You can see there's a hole there. That is where our version of it, I'm not going to stick my finger in there, that can sometimes be triggered to come out and bite whatever's there. But that there you can see is basically as big as a dollar coin. Inside there will be a spider that's bigger than my hand. I'm going to put my hand here. You can see that's how big the spider is that lives inside that hole. With fangs, probably about a half an inch long, two of them. That is the home of the golden brown baboon spider. And do yourself a favor if you're anywhere close to a computer at the moment, is just go and Google a picture of the golden brown baboon spider and you'll see the most beautiful baboon spiders, we call them in this country, but as they are affectionately known across the world as tarantulas. This is one of, so it is South Africa's largest spider and we find the golden brown baboon spider. Now, Siberia Zumi wanted to know, or wants to know, does a spider like that carry an egg sac with her? Siberia, that hole that we've just seen at the moment is from a female baboon spider. They sedentary. They dig a tunnel. They live in that tunnel. They lose the ability to dig a new tunnel when they become an adult. So she will live in this tunnel up to 30, 35 years, depending on the book that you read. They will give, well, their babies will come out of that hole and will slowly start to dig their own tunnels and radiate away from that primary hole. So she'll have babies every year. Not every year, but sometimes spiders don't have babies every single year. But on the years that she does have babies, the babies will then radiate away from the hole. Males are nomadic. They will live under leaf litter and under branches and in bushes. Females will then find their own little patch, hopefully close to where lots of insects congregate, and will then dig their own holes. And that's how the cycle goes on. So that particular spider looks after her, her egg cases in the hole. <laughs> Katrina, you, you said to everybody that you would rather hug a lion than put your hand close to a hole with a spider that size. Um, I suppose each to his own. <laughs> anyway, on that note, we're going to send you back through to Jamie. <laughs> this, oh, I was going to...
I was just having a quiet chuckle at Steph and his dislike of spiders. And I wanted to show you just the bushes. Once again, these lions giving us a bit of a run around in terms of crossing in and out of our boundaries, and around and about. And it's definitely got even colder. I'm not quite sure what the physics is behind that sudden drop in temperature around sunrise, but it definitely happens underneath the archway. You got, you got it there, Jandre? Cool. So what I was saying to Jandre there is just because we have the antenna sticking up behind us, sometimes when we go fast overhanging branches, we have to, Jandre has to reach back and push it backwards so that we don't risk doing any damage to it as we go through. If I were a lion, I'd be sitting somewhere up on the crests, trying to find the best possible patch of sun. Good place to go and sunbathe and to warm up. So Brent said or suggested that this lion might be around the fire break somewhere. The fire break is this open patch. It's Kind of like a road, but not quite. You can't. You could drive along it. It's not the most comfortable route to take, but you can drive along it. And why it's there is it's basically a section that is completely cleared of trees and branches, and it allows for, uh, for a spot that is maintained in case a fire does break out and starts traveling through an area and it just helps as a way to keep it under control and by limiting the amount of vegetation that there is to burn helps to keep a runaway fire under control and fires we're unlikely to have a bad fire season this year because although it's going to be incredibly dry there's actually not that much for fires to burn there's not that much grass about not too much grass cover in a bad year, around October, it does become very scary in terms of dry lightning storms. So the thunderstorms start, but there's not been much in the way of rain. And the, there's lightning very often strikes the dead tall trees and sets off a fire. I've been involved in fighting them before. Uh, these tracks are coming this way. Let me show you now that the light's a little bit better what we're looking at in terms of lion tracks and then we'll finish off our fire story. For some reason my earpiece has completely stopped working. I've checked where it's plugged in. Right, just to let you know, if I'm not hearing your questions, that is why. But there you go, the big pug marks, unmistakable tracks of a lion. Let me hop out for the moment and just show you exactly what it is that you are looking for. <laughs> Clutching my hot water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> to my stomach. Um, I can probably, probably do without it for now. <laughs> Just pop it in, in the car. <laughs> it is really nice and warm. It's very comforting, especially with the cold. All right, what's the best track there, genre? This one, maybe. Yeah. That one good? Now, what we're looking at here, while I try and move my shadow out of the way, is you've got a really really nice clear view of the toes one two three and four and if you look carefully at the back this is not the best drawing stick in the world but then i'm not the best artist in the world either 
We've actually got three lobes at the back. And just look at the size of this animal's foot. It's the size of my hand, easily. Going straight in that direction. The biggest toe, or the longest toe, is this toe, which means that this is the right foot. And it's actually the back foot of the lion. There's an even bigger foot here at the back, but it's not very clear. And he is striding along the road and heading back towards where we've just come from. So he's here somewhere. It's just a matter of finding him. Let us go and search and figure out where he's gone. Hopefully he's not racing east. Or we sorry, not east. He's definitely not going east. Hopefully he's not racing west to cross Buffalo Cut Line somewhere further down that way. And I suspect this is the same line that we were tracking earlier on Cheetah Cut Line. I think he's just popped out here. Hold on. Get my hot water bottle in place. <laughs> there we go. It's no fun having the wind chill factor. Right, let me... I just need to check something very quickly. I need to check that my earpiece is working, which it isn't. Which means that I cannot hear any of your questions coming through. So bear with me one second. We're going to drive along back in the direction that the tracks came from. And I'm going to see if I can fix it. And while I do that, I'm going to send you back over to Steph. You know, we've come out into this clearing and there's been a bunch of things that has just really just piqued our interest. And the first one is this stump that you're seeing in front of us here. It's actually ele some elephants have been playing here over the last couple of days and, has and have kicked open the stump. Now, to tie in with a little bit earlier, to tie in with what happens to trees as soon as they basically get knocked over by elephant is not only do they become homes for so many different animals but they decompose quite quickly. I mean this is a pretty hard tree but you can see it's quite soft already and it's it's soft because fungus, have a look at this, fungus is growing all over this tree and basically busy decomposing it and putting it back into the system again and you can see how ultra soft those are termites eating all the middle. And it's just become like super spongy. You can see how I'm just very easily just breaking it open. Now, you can see there's some millipede exoskeletons inside there. All that is from a millipede. That shows me that a scorpion has been living inside here. What I want to do is just move down the length of this particular stump and see what else we can find. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, my, this is incredible. Come over here on this side and have a look if you can see on this piece. I'm going to use some grass. Have a look and see if you can see that. That is a locust that looks exactly like this piece of stump. And she's attached to what looks like a male. He's, he's holding on for dear life onto a piece of stump just behind. That's a male. He's the smaller of the two. This is one of the crested locusts. Have a look at how camouflaged that is. Obviously, a camera can't even see it. That's his head. Can you believe it? That's the male. There he's attached to the female and there she is in all her glory she has not got any wings these crested locusts the females don't have wings the males have wings to get around to the females he would have arrived she would have been singing and he would have arrived probably sometime yesterday for them to have mated like us but have a look at that camouflage she looks exactly exactly the same as the stump that she's busy sitting on now they get their name from this crest that runs along the top of her thorax there. 
that's where she gets her name, one of the crested locusts. I just find the camouflage on these things absolutely amazing. She's obviously not running away, and the reason why she's not running away is because she's relying on her camouflage to keep her hidden. Now I've noticed something else here. This is when the elephant actually bumped over the stump. But what it's done is it's also uncovered some eggs. This is the remnants of a reptile's egg. Now it's more than likely the remnants of a monitor lizard but it could, because of the size, it's probably about an inch or two across. Snake eggs are slightly smaller. I mean, I have seen big snake eggs from pythons. It could very easily come from a python, but it's probably from a monitor lizard. They're a little bit more common in this particular area. And what would have happened was they would have dug down into the soft sand next to termite mounds, a very common place for monitor lizards to bury their eggs. Next to the termite mound, the termites, the areas near termite mounds are quite warm, substantially warmer than the areas that are adjacent to, 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 to termite mounds, and that would have helped incubate the eggs. Now, let's see what else we've got here. We've got some spiders. Now, this is also a favorite retreat of the violin spider, and I'm not going to stick my hands around the corners here with that knowing exactly what I'm getting my hands into. I don't really want to be bitten by a violin spider. They've got quite a nasty cytotoxic venom which will break down the cells in my hand or on my finger and actually cause quite bad necrosis. I don't want to be bitten by one of those. But I can't see any violin spiders. What I am getting is plagued by about 20 flies. You can have a look on my head over there. The urge not to slap myself absolutely dizzy is insane. Don't blame him. You've got a landing strip. <laughs> yep, it's because I've got a landing strip on my head that uh, they're coming in for landing, but oh, it's terrible. Another thing that's caught my eye while we're here, just before, is this crime scene from this buffalo. What's striking is the size of these horns. I mean, that is honestly a massive spread. I'm actually going to take the other horn that's lying here, just next to it. I'm going to put it back on. It would have gone something like this. There you go. And have a look at that. That is. It's big. I don't quite know how big. It's probably about a meter. Let's see in feet. Let me take from the tip. And a half feet of my feet. And I'm a size nine. So three and a half of my feet is the diameter of this horn. Horn tip to horn tip. It's incredible. Now some buffaloes have very deep um, Horns, this one's quite shallow. You can see quite shallow. Although not really, I mean I must be honest, this came right down to below the ear. The ear would have been here. Here's where the ear would have been. And a really deep, deep horn structure. The horn comes way past the ear. The horn would drop down like this almost and come up. This buffalo's got quite a shallow horn structure. Can you imagine this running? Can I have a look at this boss? That's the boss. That's what they used to bash against one another when they're busy wrestling. Nice, solid. That there is about as solid as bone as what you can get. Honeycombed. And protecting the brain, which is inside here. So the bull, buffalo bull's brain would be in its nose. You're looking at it there at the end of my finger. That's where its brain would have been encased in some bone. I'm actually going to show you from behind here. There you can see inside there you'll be able to see. Let me see if I can hold it up. Yeah. What's going to be better? You get inside there. It's a bit dark. It's a bit dark. 
bit dark to show you where its brain is, but basically the buff buffalo's brain is there. Where my thumb and my forefinger are, that's where the brain is. Encased behind this much bone, a hand of bone, and that's what protects them when they're busy bashing against one another, when they're busy wrestling with these, with these horns. Interesting, eh? Anyway, and that's this little clearing. Lots of interesting things to see inside here. And on that note, we're going to be sending you through to Jamie. Lots of interesting things to see. And I think we've actually got a herd of elephants just ahead of us. Let us go and have a look at them. Still no sign of these lions. They are walking all over the show. <laughs> trying to figure out which way they've gone. They've paced up and down the road, obviously calling, looking for each other. And I have a sneaking suspicion that they have vanished towards Torchwood. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that that is not the case. And we're just going to keep checking really, really carefully around Buffles Hook Dam in this area. They might even be on their way to where that lioness has been keeping her cubs and denning them. Andre, where did you see these ellies? Oh, their head. Awesome. The good news is, however, that my earpiece seems to be working for now, so I am getting your questions. And Sandy, your question on the subject of elephants is, do the male elephants fight each other for dominance? And the answer is yes, only really when there is a female that is in estrus, uh, a female that is ready to mate and to breed. And at that point, if there is competition between the males, then that's when they will actually have a serious fight or a serious conflict with each other. Otherwise, male elephants often play with each other, often play fight and spar. Sometimes it can look incredibly rough to our eyes, but it isn't actually. It's relatively well controlled and not too dangerous for any party concern. An elephant in must, an elephant bull in must, might be slightly more likely to pick a fight with another elephant and just spar with it. Here are these elephants gone. You can see their tracks all over the show. I'm sure we saw them here somewhere. And good morning to you, Roger. You were wondering how we learned to read tracks so carefully. Did we take classes? Is there a way that you can train or is it talent? It's definitely not talent, it's practice. I think is mainly what we would say that it is. A combination of practice and a great deal of time spent looking at the different footprints. But yes, I was I did do a training course of tracking at some point and it was probably the week in which I learned the most in the entire time during which I was training to be a guide. The wonderful thing about learning to track is that you actually at the same time learn a great deal about elephant behavior, oh, not elephant behavior, all animal behaviors. I've got elephants on the brain because there are some somewhere here. in theory, but they appear to have disappeared off. It's amazing how a six-ton elephant can disappear as quickly as they do. And unfortunately, most of them are on the northern side of our boundary. Some zebra at the back, slowly making their way quite possibly towards Buffles Hooker Dam. 
to come and have a drink. Looking absolutely incredibly photogenic in the morning light. Apparently I didn't finish telling you what I was chatting about earlier about fighting wildfires while we look at these zebra and it's a very interesting a very scary actually process fighting a runaway fire especially when the grass growth has been good and the grass is exceptionally tall and there's lots of moribund in other words dead material that is there to be burnt and you can end up driving along a road between two walls of flame and some of you will be aware, some of you will come from areas where you have experienced wildfires in the past and you'll know just how incredibly fast a fire can move through an area, particularly on a windy night. Hello Zebbies. And absolutely we don't we're not at risk of runaway fires at the moment but Austin it is indeed our dry season we do consider our winter period to be our dry season it's oh somebody's got an itchy cheek I know it's just behind the tree but <laughs> let me roll forward just a fraction there you go <laughs> zebra's using that as a really comfortable scratching post and yes Austin it is our dry period and during our winter season around these months we probably get in the region of maybe five to ten moles of rain over the next few months if we're lucky and we're very unfortunate is that we've actually been in an incredible drought over the last few months so even though we've just come out of our rainy season we didn't actually get the rain that we need we probably had about a fifth of the average annual rainfall and the year before that was also relatively bad for rainfall levels and it, it means more than anything it's not necessarily just about the water there's sufficient water for the animals out here but it's actually more to do with the amount of food particularly for the grazers such as those zebra that we were looking at earlier and I haven't given up on these lions so we're going back <laughs> Oh, Petty. Petty tells me that it's pouring with rain here in Durban. Durban being one of our largest coastal cities. Oh, Petty. Apparently that cold front is coming our way. And of course it probably won't really come with much in the way of rainfall. It'll just be chilly and cold and cloudy. And we'll be desperately looking for somewhere warm to go. <laughs> Especially in the morning. Penny, I went to Natal. When did I go to Natal? It was a couple of months ago, but I'd never seen it looking as dry as it was. And I'm hoping that that rain might help a little bit. It's been a while since I've been down south in that direction. I think it was August last year. I can only imagine that it's going to look even more so at the end of this winter period. It's a nice opportunity to watch our zebra slowly wandering off. Let's go look for this lion. It's got to be somewhere. Got my cup of tea. <laughs> On a cold morning like this, absolutely essential. And we're going back. We're going back to find this lion because he hasn't come out here. I wonder where they've disappeared off to. Now, there's been an interesting split in terms of the Birmingham boys and the way in which they've spread themselves out in their territory. Oh, there's a, from what I've been reading about lion coalitions, a number of four to five individuals up to six can be very successful, but any larger than that, and actually even at around six or so, members of a male coalition it becomes very tricky because what happens is they establish themselves an enormous territory 
as with what happened with the Mapohos many years ago, the famous coalition of six males. But in order to maintain and defend that, it means that they actually have to split off into smaller groups. And that is where they become the most at risk from other male lions. And the Birmingham boys are now down to four. Four lions trying to maintain a territory that's I would guess at at least 8,000 hectares, if not more. That's a guess. I don't have exact numbers for the size of the Birmingham Boys Territory. They've lost one member and their attention is somewhat divided. And I think that's why the Matimba males, we've hardly heard the Birmingham Boys calling around Simbambili Arethusa at all. And I think that's why the Matimba males decided to come back up north and investigate. And I've done that twice now before moving back south again to Londolozi. The Matimba males were the original coalition of this area. They were the lions that, the male lions that were here when I first started working here a year ago. They were pushed out by the Birmingham boys and they fled south. They seem to every now and again decide to come back and pay a visit. And hopefully at some point we will get to see them once again. In terms of size, if the Birmingham boys remain as split up as they are, they will have difficulty in terms of maintaining and keeping the Matimba males from moving back here. His tracks are here. Sorry. I'm just trying to do some thinking. His tracks are here going this way. Now. And his tracks popped out there for a while and then went back in. Basically, this track's doing this all over the show. <laughs> Let's try and figure out where he's gone because I think we might actually have been going in the right direction after all. Oh, very rusty. Kyle, you were wondering about whether or not it's harder or easier for a predator to kill a mixed, I mean a single herd animal, for example an impala. Kyle, I think I need a little bit more clarification about what exactly you mean there. Um, are you talking about a, a solitary animal versus a herd animal? Or are you talking about an animal that is, is associated in one big group? I'm going to take it as you're asking about hunting a solitary versus a herd animal and it depends on the it depends very much on the predator that you're talking about uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure that there's all that great of a difference or well, certainly with a herd of animals you've got a greater level of alertness so you've got those animals constantly keeping an eye on what's going on around them and you've got more than one set of eyes which means that a solitary animal might be slightly easier to sneak up upon than a herd animal. But it depends on the predator's technique. Because for example, something like a wild dog, it doesn't really care if it's seen. It's not about being sneaky, it's about sheer speed and overwhelming the animal. And in that case, it might even be easier for them to catch a herd creature just because they can, they can dash off, they can spread out, they can fan apart and to pick on whichever particular animal looks to be the slowest or happens to be the closest to them as the herd scatters away. And the same goes for the hunting style of a, hy a spotted hyena. For leopards and lions it's a little bit different. The difference with lions of course is that the solitary animals tend to be, the solitary prey species tend to be the smaller antelope and a lion is absolutely chances are not going to bother with the energy required to tackle and to hunt something like a steenbok or a daker considering that they're going to get hardly any yield out of that particular meal so they're going to expend a lot of energy and it's basically like a bite-sized snack for them let's just try going down this road maybe he'll pop out here somewhere It's 
in the right direction. Christopher in Arizona, you've asked a question that I don't know the answer to. Apparently you've been reading up about a cat called a Lykwe cat that is in theory found in South Africa and that is a cat that behaves very much like a dog. Um, not that I'm aware of, I have never heard of it. The only suggestion I could have in that sense is perhaps a conversation about a cheetah or maybe a serval, both of whom are relatively easy habitu easily habituated and the cheetah of course having semi-retractable as opposed to completely retractable claws and I've been fortunate enough to be very close to a cheetah before and playing with them is playing with like playing with a dog in the sense that their limbs feel very similar it doesn't feel like playing with a cat but other than that there's no other species that I'm aware of unless it's been introduced from somewhere but not that I can think of so sorry Christopher it's not, not the best answer to your question but I certainly haven't heard of it and I'm relatively I'm 100% certain that I know all of the cat species that are naturally occurring in this area I'm going to try to concentrate as much as possible on finding where this lion's gone from here. And while I do that, let's find out how Steph's wander through the bushes is going. Have a look at these ants that we found here. They are quite obviously grainivorous ants. In other words, they have been harvesting grain. And what you're busy having a look at over here is the husks of all the grass seeds that they've been collecting over the last couple of weeks and months. Not only husks, but you also find that they'll use this as a bit of a dump site and any ants that have died, they will actually be dumping their bodies here as well. But you can have a look at all of these seeds. They've just been collected by the ants and it's actually quite far away from their nest hole. Here you can have a look. This is the ant's nest hole. I don't know what type of ants these are, but yet they've managed to clear an entrance here and you can see all of their activities have actually excavated quite a deep hole. And there's one with some seeds going into the nest. And if we come a bit wider and I have a look at all the grass heads They've all been de-seeded. This is the inflorescence or where the grass would have had its flower and would also have its seed. And it's actually got nothing left on it. As have almost all of these grasses, that's all just de-husked. Let me see if I can find one that's got a little bit of seed on. This is what it's supposed to look like when it's got a little bit of seed. This is what it looks like after the ants have been there and after the ants have really been there. This is what it looks like, <laughs> bit of a story all three, all three ways around. And they would have then cleared an area, probably, it would be interesting actually to see where the de-seeding stops. And I'm just going to take a, a quick reconteur around where I'm standing at the moment while VM gets up. And I'm going to start at the furthest point that I feel that they'd be able to take some seeds away from and here's a grass with some seeds on so absolutely probably a good 10 or 15 feet in diameter is where the ants from this particular nest have now taken all of their seeds here's some of these I'm going to pick a seed from here and I'm going to bring it back to you so there where VM standing is the entrance to the nest here is some erigrostis grass seeds and here is the dehusked 
seeds of this particular plant. So there's one that still has the seeds in. Oh, where's it gone? Here, here's, here's one that still has the seeds in. There's one that's been dehusked. It comes from the refuse dump. Amazing. And that was just in this pretty nondescript little open area where we are at the moment. We're right up onto a crest. And what we're following up on is the sounds or the distress calls of some zebra. So we've been led into this area because of a zebra's distress call. And although these, these types of areas on these crests almost always look like there's nothing going on, it's quite often exactly the opposite. Quite nice. You can actually see a very nice example of how hard this tree is. This is a silver cluster leaf and is used quite often in the area by the local builders here as a type of support structure. This is very termite resistant, this particular tree, and incredibly hard. I mean, I'm putting some considerable effort into trying to shift this little stick for you and it's not so they use this as a fencing post they also use it as an implement handle so if you break the handle on your axe or you break the handle of your your shovel the wood from this particular tree makes for a good replacement for that until you can get to a, a hardware store and buy a replacement it doesn't mean that you have to stop what you're doing you can use one of these the wood from the silver cluster leaf now VM we just Oh, Judy H has just asked me a question now that's just caught me out. She just asked me, what is the botanical name for the purple panweed that I was showing you the other day? Um, wow, I don't actually remember that, to be quite honest, right now. I'll have to get back to you on that one. It's probably something along the words of verbena, perhaps. But I'm going to have to get back to you that one, uh, Judy. All right, now, I want to show you... This is quite obviously the shell of a giant land snail, but this one is a fresh one. This one is from this year. It hasn't quite lost all its color yet. Inside there you can see some of the leftover remains of the snail. Now what usually kills these snails are the larvae of the um, of the fireflies. Firefly larvae, they quite enjoy living in snails. But I just want to show you how effective these snail shells make as cups. I'm obviously not going to drink out of this particular one because it still has some detritus in there. But you can have a look there with my water bottle. How much water that actually holds. Now that you can put directly onto a fire and you can boil the water and then drink it. So if you had to find a water source out here and it wasn't quite fresh enough, you can absolutely use this as a container. And I'm going to show you now how much water is inside there. I'm going to pour it out a little bit at a time here. And how much water is actually used. You can absolutely see that in a very short space of time you can get yourself a lot of water in a little cup like this and that you'd then take with you and I would definitely take this with me so that we can use it as a cup if you needed to in a survival situation. Now while I've got my bag off of my back I just want to actually shake this out. I actually want to do take it. I want to show you I carry around this backpack I carry around with me almost all the time and I never ever take it off to show you anything. One thing I do want to show you is how you can transport fire. So not only did I show you, so not only did I did I bring that cup that I just showed you now, but quite often transportation of fire if you don't have matches like I have at the moment is done by using some elephant dung. So from a fire the night before, you then Oh, hang on. 
from a fire the night before, you light your piece of elephant dung, obviously I'm cheating now by using some matches, and you'll see that the wood inside the elephant dung starts to smolder. Now I will pick up these matches, don't worry, we're going to give it a little bit of oxygen there. And you can see that it's smoldering. Now not only is that a fantastic cure for headaches, it's also a very, very good way to get rid of pests. Mosquitoes and flies don't enjoy the smell of burning elephant dung, but you can see that it's smoldering. Now, when I get to a place where I want to build my fire, all I do is blow on it, like you see there, and you can see the red coals coming out. You put a little bit of tinder on that, and you have yourself a fire. Look at how much smoke is coming off of there. So this is a very, very good way of carrying fire from one place to another. And when you get to another place, you build yourself a fire, you use your snail shell cup to purify water, and you've got some of the basics of life. You've got protection in the form of fire, you've got water, purified water so it doesn't make you sick. The only thing you need else is shelter, an effective shelter. Interesting, and this piece of elephant dung, a piece this size, will smolder like this probably for about four hours before you need to find yourself another piece of elephant dung. Obviously it's dry out here everybody, so what we're going to do with this piece of fire that I've got at the moment is put it out completely. What we don't want is a runaway bushfire at this particular time of the year. I absolutely don't want don't want that. So I'm making sure that that's all out. And as you can see, I get to put to use some of the stuff that I carry around in my backpack. Now in my backpack, a lot of you are wanting to know what I carry around in my backpack. I carry a track and sign book. I carry a spider book. You may have noticed that I quite enjoy spiders. And I carry around a tree book and it's not just any tree book, it's actually a tree book that explains what the names of the particular trees are. I quite enjoy where names come from. And that's what I do. So there's that. Just pack it all in. Try and get it as balanced as what I can. I'm going to pack in the snail shell. And that's that. <laughs> Trail Backpack 101. All right, let's carry on and see what we can see. We actually, <laughs> Jennifer, thanks for, thanks for the comments about saying that I should have a flashlight with me. Actually, between the three of us, between myself and VM and Herbert, we actually carry a variety of things and VM definitely has a flashlight. So we definitely have a flashlight between us. We've also got a variety of different books. We've got a first aid kit, we've got a lot of water, we've got some snacks. And while I'll carry on exploring underneath all of these pieces of stump, Jamie's got a hornbill to show you. Well, Steph repacks his backpack, which by the way is the most organized backpack in the entire world. We've arrived at probably one of the last guari bushes that is still bearing fruit. And this yellow-billed hornbill is having an absolute field day. Picking up what's left of them. We do have a chance to view one of them at this distance. You really get an idea of just what I mean when I say that they have slightly manic facial expressions. Those bright beady eyes just look a little bit out of control and sometimes a little bit angry as well. Especially when they're pecking at the reflection of their reflection in your bedroom window. You can see him casting about, 
And now we've got an opportunity to actually really observe, well in theory we did, the way in which a yellow-billed hornbill's bill actually doesn't fully close. It very often has a gap from around the middle. It doesn't need to close completely, as long as it, the tip of the very sharp, very powerful point seals. That's all that they need. One of the big reasons why yellow-billed hornbills, as he munches away on these berries, are so widespread and diverse is that they are so adaptable in terms of what they can feed on. So in summer they will make use of the insect population explosion. We've seen them catching anything from caterpillars to various grubs, crickets, grasshoppers, all of those are on the menu for a hornbill. And then in the winter time, as we're in now, they're going to be looking for grass seeds and, as we saw now, taking advantage of one of the last fruiting guari bushes in this area. Now, there were quite a few other birds, but they've all decided to move off already. I'm going to go forward a little bit. Oh, there we go. Well done, Jandre. Jandre has picked up on what, looked like, what looks like a greater blue-eared starling. This camera is just so wonderful for sightings like this, especially in this morning sunlight. You get to see the true incandescence of a glossy starling, one of the starling members. Here they go fluttering off and that pretty much brings to the end this bird feeding party. Oh. Oh, our lion's escaped us, everybody. Ephraim's been tracking him, and he's done exactly what he did to Brent yesterday and crossed into Simbambili. After all of that, ah, there's a Birchall starling for you. Slightly longer tail, more robust body, and just have a look at the sheen to those feathers. I wish they don't tend not to sit still for any extended period of time. But that shimmer, that blue teal coloured shimmer on their feathers is purely as a result of reflection and refraction of light through keratin. <laughs> They're making Jandre work. <laughs> oh Jandre, I was very much appreciated. <laughs> the joys of filming birds live is that they don't tend to sit still. So we get these beautiful zoomed in images for just the briefest of moments. Yes, hedge your bets with that one, I think, Chandre. We might have a slightly more stable one. Oh, look at that. So despite the fact that it is a fully grown Perchel starling, um, it still doesn't quite have the glossiness of the adults. You can actually see the difference. And mom or dad working very hard there to keep it fed. It's a juvenile. This one is still a baby. And if we sit and we watch it, it lets the parent do all the work and waits to be fed. Let's just wait and see. The adult, I'm sure, will come back to it now and bring in another berry. Hey, little bird, you look big enough to me to be getting your own food. There's a whole load of berries there around you. Berries not actually really being on the, di on the menu for starlings. They will eat them, but they tend to be more towards seed eaters. Yeah, they've moved to the back. Well done, Jandre. Managing to get those on camera. Uh, we have a question from one of our viewers in Denmark who was listening to the Nightingale last night and was absolutely loving it. And they were wondering whether or not we get them here. We don't, but we get what's called a nightjar. We get different species of nightjar and they tend to be the most vocal at night, but only really in summer when it's their breeding season. And I'm absolutely incapable of imitating what a fiery-necked nightjar sounds like, but to me, 
it will always be the typical sound of a summer evening in Africa. I'm not quite sure who sent that through. My apologies. I think it might have been Kathy. I didn't quite hear which name. Oh, it was Kirsten. Kirsten. Let's go see if we can't get a better view of those kudu. Now, Kirsten, you were wondering about that. And Kirsty. My, the, my other favorite bird sound at night is the different owl species that we get and in particular the call of the pearl spotted owl and the scops owl. Oh, he's a beautiful male kudu but he's dashed across the road in front of us. I think he's going to remain quite hidden. Here we go. Oh, there we go. That's not a bad view, considering. Hello, gorgeous. He's got quite tightly spiralled horns. He was following behind that youngster that Chandre showed us earlier. And as you know, when you see one kudu, there's usually several more hidden all about you that you haven't yet spotted. And just to finish off with our subject of birds, Joey in Australia, you were wondering if we get the huge flocks of the white storks that migrate from Europe. And we do get them here. I've never seen enormous, in the areas that I've worked, I've never seen absolutely enormous flocks, but I have seen them in ones and twos throughout the low felt. And they, of course, have that incredible migration pattern where they return right back to the same nesting sites in Europe each and every single year. And the amazing thing is they get sort of separated from their mates and then they reunite. And I saw the most incredible story about, it was somewhere in Croatia, I think it was, where a white stork female had a broken wing and was not capable of making that journey every single year. And the gentleman in whose house she was living set up a really nice comfortable warm place for her to spend the winter and she would sit and she would wait every for every European summer for her mate to return and every single year he would return to her he does return to her and they still breed it just means that she can't stay and my she can't migrate backwards and forwards with him and that is definitely one of my favorite bird stories ever and about 95% of all bird species are actually monogamous in some way. And what I mean by that, it does not necessarily, not to the same extent raptors and storks are, or indeed penguins, where they have the same mate every year, but most birds at least are faithful to one mate during each breeding season. Very unusual in the animal kingdom and not something that applies to almost every mammal species. There's very, very few monogamous mammals out here. Dacre and Stienbock are one example, and blackback and side-striped jackal are another. And wild dog, to an extent, in that only the alpha male and female breed, but that's not always the case, and that's all, not always a true reflection of their breeding strategy. Sometimes the subordinate females mate and fall pregnant. It's just that their pups have a very low survival rate. Oh, our lion managed to escape us, but that doesn't mean I've given up because there are just Birmingham boys all over the show. One was on, where was, one was on a net yesterday. Two were around here and then the other one was somewhere in Biffle's Hook. So as I said earlier, they're very, very spread out. Oh, Rusty's starting to sound a little bit like a Harley Davidson when we go up the hills. Well, on the subject, of the lion movements 
Safari Dean. All right, boy. Okay. Can we stay and look at you? Would that be okay? Sorry, we'll get back to your question, Safari. Unhappy Ellie Bull. He's going to come either move off into the bushes or he's going to come and try and come up behind us to act intimidating. And before we enter into a battle of wills, we're just going to leave him. So we're not running away at this point because he hasn't quite... If he did come and threaten us, it would be a different story. What we're doing is we're just giving him a little bit of extra room. I'm acknowledging to him that I recognize he's bigger and scarier than I am, and he definitely is bigger and scarier than I am. Sorry, John, I know that's an awkward angle. Hey, boy. All right. Okay. There's a good boy. Which way are we going to go? We're just going to keep moving away. Uh, an interesting lesson in animal behavior here. I'm keeping out of his way because he clearly doesn't want me to be too close to him. And he's trying to decide still exactly what he's going to do. He's going to move off. It's important to remember in one's interactions with elephants that we're in their home. Now, any time you've irritated an elephant, even if it is completely accidental, even if it is totally unavoidable, the onus is on us to act responsibly in interpreting their body language and to accepting the messages that they're giving us. Uh, it didn't help that because Rusty's feeling a little bit ill, we had to rev our way up the hill and just upset him ever so slightly. And there's a lot of bulls at the moment that are from the Kruger National Park and they're not quite as used to vehicles as others. And I think this is the same big boy that we saw earlier that we tried to get on camera on the sunrise safari. Is <laughs> he tearing apart the vegetation? <laughs> So why I moved from where I did was first of all to give me a better escape route if I needed to and second of all to acknowledge the message that he was giving me. Now, he was telling me that I was in his, for his personal space, he was uncomfortable with my position and we acknowledged that by moving away a little bit but not driving away completely. And there's differing opinions on this, of course, but there's a lot of credit giving to, given to the idea that an elephant must also not learn at the same, on the other side of the scale, must also not learn that it's okay and acceptable to go and intimidate and to chase cars because they do learn it and it does become a habit. So that's why we changed our direction, moved about a little bit just so that we were out of his personal space and then we stopped and we just gave him the message that it's okay, we don't mean him any harm, all is well. And he's off quite peacefully feeding in the distance. Hurry, boy. Let me leave you to your breakfast. Yes, I think so. And we'll carry on with Safari Dean's question about the Birmingham boys. And whether or not the increased presence of other lions, especially the Matimba males, but also the, the Mangani pride, the Salala breakaway pride, have also strayed a couple of times into their territory as well as in other areas you were wondering whether or not that might mean that we might see the Birmingham boys together more often and less spread out than they are at the moment and yes absolutely I think that that will be the case um, depending on how you know if the Matima males start to move into Simbambili and start to call because at the moment I haven't heard them making any noises when they do make their little incursions into the edge of a Birmingham boys territory. But the standard coalition response is yes, 
to band together when faced with a common threat. Even if you do get an almost permanent split, so let's say they move off with Blondie and number three move off together and the other two stay in a separate part of the territory and that becomes their part of the territory. Even if that occurs, you will still find them coming back together to face any kind of intrusion, whether it be the Matimba males or any other type of, um, or any other male lion making their way into this vicinity. And a very warm welcome to Andy and Julia while we position ourselves to have a look at half of the Inyala population of Juma that appear to be gathered together in one herd. You were wondering on the subject of male lion coalitions whether or not lions could band together, um, or whether an unknown or an unrelated male lion could join a coalition after that coalition is established. And whether or not that ever occurs and it is unlikely that that will occur. Um, as you know it's relatively common for male lions. Actually you know what Andy and Julia sorry can we finish off this question once we're done with Inyala? I'm trying to split my brain between watching what they're doing and answer you at the same time and it's a bit jarring to talk about lions and watch these pretty antelope. I think this morning light, you can even see the finest hairs of her beard and those long, long eyelashes for protecting those eyes. The other reason that I'm so distracted in talking about lion coalitions is there's a woodpecker somewhere that I can hear and I cannot see. I'm just trying to find it for you. What we've got in this herd 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 Nyala. I have never seen such large herds of Nyala before I started working at Juma. It's incredible there are just so many of these big herds. This is one of the areas where there's a good chance that these Nyala's ancestors were actually introduced to this particular part of the Kruger. Nyala are actually only really naturally occurring in the southern parts of South Africa. Natal, where Peggy is from, and then right up in the northern part of the Kruger National Park towards the Pafuri Camp. The rest of the populations have been introduced. But they thrive here and it is, I mean it's still an indigenous species, it's still a species that might have wandered through this area in the past, it's just that this is generally not their, this was not their, their natural home historically. And behind them comes a large kudu, well I say a large kudu, large in comparison to the Inyala, he's actually quite a young male horns only just starting to peek through and those enormous ears. So part of the same tribe of antelope, kudu and inyana, the kudu are the larger form and they probably all share a common ancestor, kudu, nyala, bushbuck as well as the elant, all part of the spiral horned antelope family. And all, I think, prob this, they have to be some of the most attractive antelope that we get out here. Especially with those dramatic facial markings. Almost look as though they've got tribal paint on their faces. And James? James Richards was wondering whether or not all of the brains of the antelope are relatively similar in size in proportion to their body size. 
I have absolutely no idea. I'm really sorry. I wish I could give you a more accurate answer. My guess would be yes, probably close to similar in proportion. I think that from what I understand, Chemsbok or Oryxes actually have quite small brains and very thick skull skulls around the brain cavity. He's a little baby kudu. It's too sweet. Look at its marking on its bottom. Oh, no, sorry, I'm looking at a different baby. Sorry. I was just busy looking through the monitor at the, at the one behind there. They just looked so similar. All right, now I'll have a look at its marking on its bottom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fun little stripe there. Yes, little one. Oh, my word. It's all the trephalophagues of, of Juma have arrived. Now we've got the male in Yala. Distracted by trying to follow the female plus intimidate each other at the same time. It's always funny to watch that happen because, as you know, Nyala like to do that slow dance to intimidate each other. But when you see two of them trying to follow behind with a group of females, they try and puff themselves up and move slowly and intimidate, but at, at the same time catch up with the females all at once. Um, they get a little bit confused. They're not very good at multitasking. Sorry, boy. Am I being insulting? Here's the <laughs> really nice comparison between Inyala and Kudu. I have no idea, however, James, what their brain size is in comparison to each other. Not a clue. I don't know if there's any antelope species that is smarter than another. Male Inyala having the most distinctive sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. Males darker in colour and much larger. As with Kudu, that dimorphism not quite as clear, but a very big difference in size between a male and a female Kudu. And I'm going to try and reposition because this is actually a really enjoyable scene with so many of them together in one group. And Kudu and Inyala tend to be the two antelope species that new people visiting South Africa for the first time get very easily confused between. However, while I reposition, I was answering, answering Andy and Julia's question about the coalitions. And you were asking about whether, sorry, I know this is disjointed, but just so that I don't forget to answer your question. Whether or not a, an established coalition will allow a new member. It has happened and it has been recorded in the past that an established coalition has all of a sudden seemingly accepted a new male and it was there were a lot of there was a lot of conjecture and supposition that that male might actually have been related to those males in some way as you know unrelated males especially if they're on their own will form a coalition together if they can just because there is such an advantage in terms of having more than one male so much so that it doesn't actually matter to them whether or not they are related to each other perhaps that answers that a little bit better for you mini antelope. It is actually really genuinely quite unusual to see this many Inyala together in a group. I've never seen it until I arrived and started working at Juma. I usually see Inyala in groups of two or three unless they're gathered round a, a garden. Inyala are very typical lodge garden antelope. They get used to people quickly and they like the freshly watered lawns of a lodge. Plus they know that they are relatively safe there. The chances of a predator being brave enough to come through is relatively slim. They like to gather about on lawns of gardens. And there was one little baby in Yala where I used to work that would follow me around, follow all of us around actually, 
it did it I mean its mum hadn't died, mum was still around, but mum just kept abandoning it and it would wander between us and it would come and you'd be standing talking to someone and all of a sudden this little Inyala would come and suckle on your finger. It was a very strange experience. Something that we had to discourage unfortunately because you know, in a year's time, if it had turned out to be a male with those pointed horns, full grown like this is okay, but a young male with almost dagger-like straight pointed horns that are still growing, that are still very sharp, could actually be exceptionally dangerous, even if it would be completely unintentional. And there have been a few recorded deaths by Nyala, garden Nyala, accidentally stabbing the people who, in whose garden they live. Here's a little male that's trotting ahead with those sharp dagger-like horns, looking so much like the females, but he is in front of them. There you go. And that's the stage where a, a tame Inyala can be quite dangerous. I also once had to push an Inyala bull out of a kitchen before. They're very big animals, especially because I'm not, a, I'm not an enormous human being, to put it mildly. And to try and grab one by the horns and try and get it to leave, when I mean, it's probably about a good 80 to 100 kilograms, close to 200 pounds, is a very interesting experience. Luckily for me, he was feeling particularly peaceable, and so quite happily backed away and out of the house. My assumption was it wasn't the first time he'd been manhandled to get him out. Alright, well, the rest of them are all disappearing into the drainage line, so we're going to carry on and see what we can find for the last few moments of the Sunrise of Safari, or the last half an hour of the Sunrise Safari. And while we do, let's head across to Seth, who has found a tree for you. It sounds like you've been having an absolutely amazing time where you are with Jamie. It sounds like all the life in the whole of Juma today is where she is at the moment. Now, we decided that we'd share this beautiful tree with you. It's an albizia, and albizias are very, very similar to acacias, except that they don't have any thorns on. And they also grow in very specific areas. This particular albizia is growing on top of a crest near the sandy patch. And we're going to go and see, show you why it's called the sandy patch in a bit. But I very rarely do I pass a tree that is this old and this big without giving it a hug. I think it's important that trees like this share an instant of their massively long lives with people. It's only really when you sit and consider what this particular tree has seen in its life that it gets put into context for me. This tree probably saw the first plane come over that ever was to fly across South African skies. It's at a point seen the first satellite in the, no in the night sky. It saw the first European travelers travel underneath its boughs. This tree is four or five or six hundred years old. Can you imagine what this tree has seen in its life? And although right now it's got these broken branches that I'm busy standing on and its bark is peeling off and pieces of it is broken off and you can see that even right up to the top it's, it hasn't got such a big crown but it's still here. Even though it's an old granddaddy of a tree, this tree is still here and it's still growing and it's still fantastic and I definitely like to share things like that you? and I equally don't like to pass on the opportunity to give trees like this a hug. Now we are in the middle of the sandy patch. These particular trees really enjoy to grow where you've got really deep these granitic soils. And the underlying rock structure that we have in the Sabi sands is granite. Granite eventually turns into clay but have a look at this. Million years old. So what's left is generally just quartz. And quartz will be the clear white granules that you can see 
that's a piece of quartz. Now quartz in terms of hardness, just to give you some idea, is harder than what stainless steel is. So that's a piece of quartz. In other words, what I'm trying to say is very resistant to weathering. And then you've got these other pieces in here. That's a piece of feldspar. So quartz and feldspar. Quite often you find mica in these ones. But generally this handful that I've got now is just f made of feldspar, very, very hard. That's the orangey ones. And then the clear ones are pieces of of quartz. And that's exactly why you get these soils. Very well drained, quite deep soils. Not much, not good at holding water at least anyway. Not much likes to grow on them. But do, a few plants do. This Albezia is one. This, these Combretums are another. They quite enjoy it. This is a variable bush willow. There's a few scraggly types of acacias. And then of course the marulas and the knob thorns love this deep drained sandy soils. And it's through these soils that the water percolates. And as soon as they hit the clay, clay will also sift through these soils. As soon as they hit the clay layer, the water then runs along the outside edge of the clay. And that is where we start to get the seep lines developing that I've shown you from time to time on the walks. And what's another lovely piece of these soils is that they just hold such awesome tracks. This is a game path that I'm busy walking on at the moment. And who knows how long this game path has been here. It's actually a game path that joins Sydney's dam to some feeding areas quite close to Rebecca's Road. And so I don't think that this is one of those elephant paths that you see crossing drainage lines that could be, oh look at that. So have a look right here. We've just startled a Franklin that's come off of her nest. So that is the nest of a crested. She's now flown off. And there you can have a look at the scrape that is a Franklin's nest. They don't build, they don't build nests that are in trees. They don't really even build much of a nest. It's literally just grass that's flattened into a bowl and there are her eggs there. I want to get too close. I don't want to scare her away, but I'll move forward and I'll give you literally a couple of seconds of just seeing how big the eggs are so that I can give you some or other type of... There's my thumbnail. And you can see her eggs there. I'm not going to pick them up or touch them. Birds are very particular about how they keep their eggs warm and if I were to pick up that egg and put it down in a different position what you could do is you could get the temperature not quite what she wants it at and then you can do some damage to the growing embryo inside there. So we're not going to touch those eggs, we're going to leave this area in actual fact and let her come back as quickly as what she can to sit on her eggs. Now you've all seen Franklins and you see how fantastically camouflaged they are and that's exactly what she was doing over there. Sitting on her eggs, hunkered down and then I got a little bit too close and she jumped up and she flew away. And that's really the only way that I saw her. So coming back to this game path that we're on, you can actually see the path. Vim is, we'll try and find it for you now in frame. You can actually see the path going away into the distance, literally just joining Sydney's dam to feeding areas and as this path gets further and further away from a dam what you get is you get these them starting to split and starting to bifurcate and starting to filter into the bush so it's always a good idea in actual fact I can show you right here if you're ever looking for water and that's just coming back to our earlier segment about finding water and and safety and shelter if you're ever looking for water in a trackless trackless or featureless piece of ground that we got at the moment, a very good way is to follow joining pathways. So if you come and stand here, Vian, exactly where you are in actual fact, here we've got a pathway there, we've got a pathway there coming towards where I'm standing at the moment and a pathway here coming towards where I'm standing at the moment. They join exactly where we're standing and then they go off in that direction through the bush and you can actually follow the pathway through the bush. That is the direction to water. So if you're looking for water, 
this would be the direction that I'd go in if I was in the bush. Joining pathways, going that way into the bush, you'll find you some water. You then collect a snail shell. You fill it with the water. You boil it over your elephant dung fire, or at least the, 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 uh, the coals from the elephant dung that you've made, and that'll purify some water. Remember, we can't go for more than three days without water out here. Food we can last three weeks with, so food isn't a major concern initially. Although, that being said, if I was really hungry, I wouldn't have hesitated to raid that, Franklin, that Franklin's nest. So I would have had food, I know where water is, I've got a way to purify that water and a way to carry fire. That's my safety, that's my security, and that's what's going to make me feel good at night time. So all four essentials we've got for you this morning on the walk. And I must say it's been a pretty easy walk. It's not always that easy to find the essentials out here. I must be honest, sometimes you can actually feel like you're very alone in a, in a trail situation. Elizabeth has just asked the ever-present question that a lot of wilderness trails guides like myself ask one another. Would I be able to survive in the bush? Elizabeth, I'm afraid to say no. Um, and the reason I say that is, is quite simple, is that although I know a lot about wilderness trails guiding and I can probably st keep myself alive for about a week or so, for me to actually live in the bush requires a skill set that I, I don't have just yet. It requires someone with constant practice of living in these wilderness scenarios. And um, I think that those, those skills are actually quite rare nowadays. Even though people do have the theory and you can rub sticks together and you can make a fire and you can carry elephant dung, you can purify water, I'm definitely going to come out on the other side of a wilderness trail uh, looking a lot more bedraggled than what I look at the moment. I could probably keep myself safe. I could probably keep a couple of other people. The longest wilderness trails I've done with people have been about a week long, five days. But at five days, I must be honest, I'm very hungry and it's yeah, very hungry, very cold, quite often quite scared. So, no, in actual fact, that's what I'd like to say. I, I probably wouldn't. But on that quite depressing note, we're going to send you through to Jamie, who's got some tracks to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we never have to test our survival skills out in the middle of the bush. However, I'm going to test your tracking skills for the last sort of section of the sunrise safari let's see if you can rack your brain brains oh my word or apparently i can't use mine rack your brains and tell me what track it is that you are looking at and of course to add insult to injury there's lion tracks walking all over it <laughs> there's lion tracks walking that way there's lion tracks walking that way there are lion tracks absolutely everywhere Andrew's found two of the Inkahuma females on the northern side of Sydney's dam going east. He said that they might pop out at some point somewhere here for the afternoon since they're busy following a herd of buffalo that is heading in this direction. One female, whether or not it's the one that Andrew has or not, has walked straight across the track that I'm quizzing you on. Um, let me get out and just see. Let, let Jean show me that track again. Let me see if I can't if I can ask you one further thing or not. I'm trying to decide if I can ask you direction as well. Oh, I can. I can ask you direction. Look very, very carefully. And I'm not even getting out to show you because that'll give it away. I want to know what type of animal made this track and what direction it is going in. So in other words, is it coming towards me or is it going away from me in the direction that jean -Dre's camera is traveling now? Towards or away from Jamie? We're going to pretend that we don't see the lion tracks that are on top of it. I'm certainly trying to at any rate. No, I'm joking, we will go and try and follow them. But let's see if you can rack your brains and tell us what made this track. And there it vanishes. I know that... Oh, no, oops, I nearly gave it away. Nearly, nearly gave it away. I'm not going to. I to keep quiet. Let's just say that there's sort of a similarity to what 
Steph was talking about. Now talking about tracks, before I jump out, Aaron, you were wondering about the difference between spotted and brown hyena tracks and how different they are. The answer is not very. They're very similar in size for the front track. The biggest difference lies, you know how with hyena tracks, you've got the big, big front foot and then very small back foot. In brown hyena, that is even more pronounced. And in fact, it almost looks as though there's a baby walking next to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hop out and I'll draw what I mean so that you can get a, a comparison of the two. You'll also, in the right substrate, in very soft sand, you'll also be able to see fur marks in the track of a brown hyena. They're much shaggier, they have a lot more fur around their feet, and that occasionally leaves marks in the soil around it. Now I'm going to do something very naughty and obscure. I'll just do it here. Let's try and draw it. Or I'm not going to try and trace out a hyena track completely. What I'm going to do, once I've found myself a good drawing stick, what I'm going to do is just draw the size comparison between the front and the back foot. Now in a spotted hyena, let's say this is the front foot, oh, that's a bit much, that's an exaggeration. Is it showing up nicely there, Jandre? Thank you. Let's say this is the front foot, big round, that's the outline of the track and then the back foot falls somewhere here and looks kind of like that. Now, that's, imagine there's a spotted hyena footprint in there. So I'm just giving you the size comparison. In a brown hyena, this back track actually looks kind of like that. It's really, really small in comparison to the front track. Now my artistic abilities would be stretched beyond um, repair in terms of trying to draw out a hyena track completely, but I'm going to try just to give you a rough idea. There's the back pad and the crescent shaped toes. I don't know how clearly this is showing up, Jandre. Not really. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch, but that's sort of what I mean in terms of size. Back pad here. Oh, my drawing stick's also falling apart, which doesn't help. Here's the toes. No, that's about as clear as mud. But you get the idea in terms of size. Now, I've yet to see a brown hyena here, but there's always hope. Habitat's a little bit wrong for a brown hyena. They prefer the more rocky areas. There's also a very, very high concentration of spotted hyenas. So high that I think that they might be... Well, their population would be purely nomadic if we did see one moving through this area. All right, let's go find that lion for the last moment of this sunrise safari. Uh, Jennifer, you think it is an anteater, the track that we're quizzing you on. Good answer, because yes, anteaters do create a, a mark where they have dragged a certain part of their anatomy. I'm trying not to give it away here. The difference is that side-to-side -side motion you don't get in an anteater track. You'll only get that, you'll get a sort of a straight drag behind them. And a lot of the time you don't even see it. A lot of the time, because they've lifted their bodies up and they've lifted their, their anatomy up, it doesn't drag in the dirt. And this, this animal, and it is an animal, has come a long way, because his tracks are still in the road every now and again. Nathaniel, getting closer, you think that this animal is a snake and that it's coming towards me. It is definitely coming towards me. You are absolutely right. It is coming towards me. However, it's not a snake. And I'll tell you why. This is going to sound very bizarre, but a snake track is hardly ever as uniform as this particular track is. But the giveaway 
Let me try and be nicer to you. I'm trying to see if I can't find a clearer spot here. The track's still with us. The giveaway is that... Oh, sorry. I got distracted by lion tracks again. The giveaway is that there, there's more to the track than just this. So it's not a snake. But it, you are getting much closer. And I'm trying to find you a nice example to show you what I mean. But you were correct, Nathaniel. It is definitely coming towards me. No, unfortunately, I can't find a clearer example than the one that we showed you earlier. There was, the, the evidence was there. The giveaway was there. And it doesn't help. The reason I can't show you here is because baboons have walked on top of it which really is confusing matters almost completely oh look here's something it definitely wasn't but nevertheless an enjoyable moment hello Nice, very peaceful sighting. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Hello. Let's not come and cause trouble, eh, boy? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, you go and you eat that senna. What's really nice with this camera is that if he stays still for us, you might actually even be able to see a hole with the temporal gland. Ah, ah! Hey! Stop it! Enough! Ah, ah, boy! Ah, ah! Come on, boy! Hey! Come on, boy! Ah, ah! Come on! Nicely, my boy! We're not being horrible. And he's going to swing his head. No, he's just coming to show us how big and scary he is. Let's just keep an eye on what he's doing. He's feeding. <laughs> Jean Dre. He's going to come back onto the stump. We're trying our best to try and show you this five line skink it's actually a variable skink it's it's one of the biggest variable skink that i've ever seen in my life and this little variable skink is generating some temperature it's cold-blooded so it's generating some temperature for itself on the stump now what's quite interesting about these little guys and i'm going to see if vm can see it in actual fact is that on the top of their head there's a little dimple and that is called the pineal eye that is a third eye that reptiles possess. It's light sensitive. It doesn't have an external organelle. It's just got that little dimple on top of the head that you can see. And that eye is there to judge length of day. And it helps reptiles like this to judge when it's going to be best to come out from hibernation and from inactivity periods when, it's, when, uh, when the sun isn't at its best for them. The pineal eye or the third eye. Reptiles have a light sensitive third eye. Can you believe it? And what's happening now is this little variable skink is relaxing on this dark stump. This dark stump or this burnt stump would have or would be collecting a lot of the sun's heat at the moment and enabling the skink, quite clever in actual fact, to not only gather temperature from the direct rays but also from the radiation generated from this black wood which would be much warmer than any of the other vegetation around here. What a beautiful little guy. You can see he's actually flattened out his tummy now, spread his legs nice and wide turning towards the camera and that you may have caught that very very slight blink that he gave 
Skinks have eyelids, unlike geckos, which don't. A skink and a lizard is almost exactly the same thing. For those of you who might be wondering, what's the difference between a lizard and a skink? There is a difference, but it's not a big one. Both of them are daytime animals. They've both got eyelids, claws. They both have a tail, believe it or not, that they can shed. So just at the base of that tail, if something had to grab this particular skink, it could shed the tail. The tail then flips around and acts as a wounded animal and quite often will draw the attention of the would-be predator away from the skink who then can escape. And the particular ability of a skink to lose the tail is called autotomy. And although he will grow or she will grow the tail back to some degree, it is almost always stunted. It would never grow back to the same degree that an octopus, for instance, could grow back a tentacle. So octopi and squid are some of the world's best regenerative animals. They can regenerate a limb almost entirely, whereas a skink that sheds its tail or a lizard that sheds its tail they grow back this little stunted one and that ability to shed its tail to act as a to act as a decoy basically giving that animal some time to come off it's called autotomy now VM had to make a quick retreat from where he was at the moment and that is because a wasp a flightless wasp this is a wasp called a velvet ant and although it's called an ant it's actually a species of wasp this is the female she is flightless and she lives on the pupae of ants and termites. So this little wasp has got two very distinctive features for it to be allowed to prey on pupae like that. A is it's incredibly hard. It's got a very, very, very tough exoskeleton. And B, she can mimic the pheromones of a particular ant or termite host so that they don't attack her. So she can mimic the smell, for lack of a better word, or better description, of a termite colony or an ant colony that she's busy using as a host for her babies. So wasps, their larvae are, are carnivorous. A wasp larvae needs to be fed meat. Wasps tend to be uh, nectivores. They, they tend to like nectar and flowers. So she will not eat meat. She will hunt meat generally for her youngsters, her larvae, wasp larvae are carnivorous, and this particular velvet ant hunts for ants and for termites. Isn't that fantastic? I had a friend once in a game reserve, his name's Elliot Mgiba, he's one of the best field guides I've ever met in my life, and when he used to find one of these velvet ants, he used to pick it up, pick them up, and he used to put it in his pocket and then he used to keep it there and he said his luck exponentially increased the more he could take one of these stings so the wasp would repeatedly sting him through the pocket and he would be in the most intense pain until he couldn't take it anymore and then he'd take the wasp out of his pocket and he'd put it on the ground and that was the way that he generated luck and he truly believed it in all the years I knew him and I knew him for a good nine and a half years I never ever saw him miss the opportunity to sting himself senseless with one of these wasps and that wasp has a sting probably close to about half an inch long but Jamie has repositioned and she's got some signal back and I'm sure before we close the show she wants to show you all those Ellie she's found we'll see you in a bit And as you can see, all is fine and well on the back of Rusty. It was terribly bad timing for us to have a loose cable that sent us off your screens just as we were busy chatting a little bit to an elephant. Nothing majorly aggressive, just by the way, in that body language. He just decided he was going to come and try and intimidate us. I waited until he'd calmed down ever so slightly and then he was feeding next to us and then I just moved off to give him some space. <laughs> he's now just, 
he is standing behind us. I'll try and reposition a moment. He's just pulled off an enormous branch. There was this huge crunching, cracking sound coming from behind us. Now, nothing serious at all. I just feel as though that perhaps the, the attack of the gremlins there could have been ever so slightly better timed. <laughs> but we've got a nice way to end off our sunrise safari. Let's try and reposition so you can see him. I also think he just kind of wanted that tree that we were right next to. That's not the easiest angle in the world. We've got a really nice view of both of them here. Here we go. So that's our gentleman who was coming to walk towards us. Ah, many of you have been racking your brains to try and figure out exactly what the answer to the track was. Uh, very well done to some of you. I think that you have been getting it right. <laughs> Andy and Julia have said that the, the track is of gremlins making their way away from us and towards Brent. As you can tell, Brent, obviously Wendy, not Brent, Brent is fine, but Wendy is not back up and running and hopefully will be sorted by the sunset safari otherwise it will be myself out on bushwalk and brent on drive or vice versa and something similar in terms of an arrangement <laughs> ladybugs and daisies this says it's a garden hose that's very funny um, <laughs> it's not a garden hose um not today <laughs> maybe at another stage <laughs> and well done to Oli, Heidi and Georgian and many others who got it absolutely spot on. It was indeed a monitor lizard. Impossible for us to tell which species it was. It was either a rock or a water monitor like lizard or a Nile monitor is the other name for water monitor lizard. But we have no idea. However, very well done to you. It was indeed. And if you looked very carefully, go back and have a look at the screenshots. You'll be able to see where his feet were on either side of that particular track. So well done to you guys and what a lovely way to spend the last few moments of our sunrise safari but with these gentle giants, gentle-ish giants. <laughs> that bush willow seems to be giving plenty of trouble. <laughs> enormous branch that he's now got to try and deal with in breaking different pieces. I don't think he meant to break off such a large branch. I think he meant to break off a slightly smaller one. But unfortunately it all came as one. Now he's got to sift through it. There we go. He's going to do his conveyor belt chewing. Is he going to eat all of the bark? Oh, is he going to eat the solid wood as well? Using his trunk. There we go. First mouthful. Doesn't seem like a very appetizing choice for breakfast, but then I'm not an elephant. And personally, I'm quite looking forward to the prospect of a couple of fried eggs and whatever else we can find in the kitchen. We shall see. Oh, it's warmed up nicely and we've got the prospect of the lions coming back onto the property for the sunset safari. You'll just have to stay tuned and join us in order to find out. Uh, big thank you to Jandre. Jandre, thank you for all of your fantastic camera work. We are very fortunate to have such a talented cameraman working for Wild Earth. And thank you to Rebecca and to Louise in Final Control. And Brent says thank you, or I'll say thank you on Brent's behalf for those brief, brief moments that you saw him for, for the split second this morning, as well as from Steph. Big thank you to all of you for your company as always, your questions and your comments. We will catch you for the sunset safari. 
Bye-bye and have a lovely day.